We'll talk the draft. We're going to talk overtime. We're going to talk all of the stuff that's going on around the NFL with my good friend Paul Burmeister of NBC Sports. Paul, it just never stops. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but it never <laughs> stops. And I'll tell you how I noticed it. Okay. As we record this, it's April 5th. It's a Tuesday, the first Tuesday in April. And as I wrote in my column this week, you know, when when it when the calendar turns to April, a young man's thoughts turn to the NFL draft. And <laughs> I just think that this is about the latest that I've really started to dig deep into the NFL draft because there's been so much else going on. It's amazing how much, uh, how this time of the year has changed, Peter. And it just feels different every day when you're somebody, uh, you've been doing it for a little longer than I have, but for the better part of the last two decades, March and April, I've been thinking about the draft and really trying to come up with the most interesting way to, to present draft content. And I, I, I was kind of thinking about it this way, Peter. Ten years ago today, I was hosting a show called Path to the Draft. And it was about this time of year where combine's done. Pro day season isn't as heavy anymore. You can't do a mock draft every single day. We were really in the point of the year where we were leading a show with talking about what's the difference between the number one tight end and the number two tight end. Come back when we return here on the show, we'll discuss whether the top center can play guard and tackle as well. I mean, we were that much into the minutia <laughs> yeah. of the personnel of the draft. And now if you're thinking about the draft every day or every week, you have a lead story with first round picks and star players being moved. Really, it's not every day, but it's every single week there's a new topic like that to address. So uh, yeah. I've gone from thinking about uh, draft minutia with players to like all these trade headlines we've been presented every single week. You know, I, I, I've I really tried to put this offseason into some sort of perspective. But the fact is, I just kept thinking this yesterday. When this trade happened, so yesterday, I'm sorry, I should refer to the day. This trade happens mid-afternoon on Monday. And I texted both general managers, Howie Roseman and Mickey Loomis, Howie Roseman of the Eagles and Mickey Loomis of the Saints. And what is so interesting about this trade is that I think over maybe a two-hour period, it got a lot of attention in the social sphere. And then it was sort of forgotten and hey, life moves on, what's next? And I said to myself, in any other year, that would have been, not maybe any other year, but in many other years, that would have been a two-day story uh, because of all the different things that this trade can mean. And Paul, I'll ask you first of all, just in general, what the New Orleans Saints did, and I talked to Mickey Loomis about this on Monday night for for a good period of time, 20 minutes maybe. And one of the things that he said is basically, uh, so let's, let's, let's just recap the trade. The New Orleans Saints traded up into the middle of the first round to get an extra mid first round pick and gave, basically gave the Philadelphia Eagles a treasure trove, a one this year, a one next year, and a two in 2023, or I'm sorry, a two in 2024. And so for people who don't really kind of get where that leaves everything, the New Orleans Saints now have the 16th and 19th picks in the first round of the draft, and the Philadelphia Eagles have the 15th and the 18th picks in the first round of the draft. So basically, they're all but equal, uh, you know, in the middle of the first round right now. And in order to do that, the New Orleans Saints traded a one next year and a two in 24 to be able to have that luxury of having two picks smack dab in the middle. And so Mickey Loomis's reasoning for this was was very interesting. When I look at it, I look at the Philadelphia Eagles basically saying, 
we want insurance in case next year we need to have ammo to move up to get a quarterback if we decide that Jalen Hurts is not going to be our long-term quarterback. And the Saints have a much different view of this. The Saints say, hey, look, we understand that this draft might not be as good as some other drafts either in the future or the past in great players at the top. And I get that. But Loomis's point to me is that he said, let's say that two of the top 15, we stay right where we are, and we get two of the top, let's say, 15, 17, 18 players on our board. Let's just say we do that. He goes, I'm telling you right now, there's two guys um, in that area where we think are going to be, there's two guys we really, really like a lot. And we think that if we do nothing else and just sit here, we're going to get two players who can help us right away. Now, one of the things that we did talk about is that in his mind, he said, we absolutely are not done. In the next three weeks, we're going to be listening because obviously there are other players that we're, we're very interested that are probably going to go earlier than we pick. And the value of picks in this draft, everybody says, well, you know, it's going to be really different. You're not going to have teams lusting over it and making huge trades. He brought up the Chicago Bears trade up with the New York Giants last year in the draft. Remember the Bears go up from 21 to 11 and they trade this year's number one and then, you know, there was other picks involved. But in essence, in order to move up 10 spots from 21 to 11, the Bears gave, you know, the following year's first round pick. So now that pick, Basically, with the Giants, the Giants have the fifth and seventh picks in this draft. And Loomis's point was, you never know if there's going to be a team that, as our pick, one of our picks approaches, is going to be desperate to move up. He said, let's say one of the quarterbacks is there that somebody really wants. And who knows, they may trade up and we may be able to, to get a bounty for it. So Mickey Loomis's feeling with the Saints right now is we'll be very happy to sit there with two picks in the teens and use both. But we also just want to keep our eyes and ears open because we might be able to get a great trade as we get closer to the draft or even on draft night and teams get desperate. Listen, Peter, we, we have all kind of sensed the same thing, heard the same thing, read a lot of the similar stories that it's not a wonderful draft at the top in terms of marquee players. However, I, I think your conversation with Mickey Loomis brings up a point that as we kind of round the corner into the final part of this draft season, we should all keep in mind that just because it's not seen that way as a whole, it doesn't mean there won't be one team, doesn't mean there won't be five teams right. that eyes one player, just one in an otherwise average to poor draft at the top end that they decide they have to have to take it to the next step. So uh, I'm with you. I, I think that we're not done hearing about draft day trades. And I think that the fact that, that this isn't a wonderful class won't change the risk or the threats or the likelihood that we're going to see more big deals as we get closer to the draft and even on draft night. Paul, I want to go through what is basically, I'd, I'd call it an exercise and nothing more <clears throat> in the top of this draft. That's what I did on the top of my column on Monday. I basically projected what I think right now could and probably should happen in the top 10 of the draft. And I just want to go over each choice and then I want to talk about two players in particular. I want to talk about Drake London, the receiver from uh, USC. And I'd like to talk about Derek Stingley, the cornerback from LSU. But let's go through them pick by pick. 
I'll give you my quick reasoning, and I just want to get your reaction on each one. So we're going to start, obviously, with Jacksonville at number one. I gave them Aiden Hutchinson. And look, even though Jacksonville right now has paid significant guaranteed money to an edge rusher, Arden Key, he's one of the most inconsistent players uh, at that position in the league over the last few years. So that is... That's a nice backstop, uh, basically, to Josh Allen and Dwayne Smoot. But regardless of that, Josh Allen and Dwayne Smoot both have contracts that expire at the end of 2023. You don't know what the future is. And I just think right here, Aiden, H Aiden Hutchinson fits. Plus, we don't know that he's going to be a, a 15-sack guy, but we do know that he's a very, very good all-around edge player, very good against the run, and um, I just think he's a good cornerstone player for the Jags. Fits really well into their front seven. Peter makes a lot of sense and uh, appears to be, while there's no such thing as safe with that kind of a investment and that kind of money, maybe the safest way to go. I would also keep this in mind. It doesn't seem likely but we do know that Trevor Lawrence is priority number one in that building. There are a couple of offensive tackles who are kind of league-wide seen as top 10 or maybe even right. top five caliber tackles. I wouldn't be surprised if they went that route just because of what Trevor Lawrence <laughs> means to that franchise and his development in the next four or five years. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> this is probably a little bit inside baseball, but I'm going to tell you why I didn't do that. Um I know a little bit about what the Jaguars are thinking right now, but I also know that <clears throat> they view Cam Robinson, who is their current left tackle, as a guy who's good enough at that position. And I can't really envision them picking a tackle who likely, or I should say, as of today, probably would be a right tackle for them. And again, the reason I say it's inside baseball is that I think if you can get a great tackle and you like that player better than the edge guy, you should take him. Because I don't care if he plays left tackle or right tackle. You know, you you only really know that you need one when you see what it's like when you don't have one. So <clears throat> I won't be shocked if they go tackle, but I gave him edge. Let's go to Detroit at number two. Now, a couple of things here. I hear Detroit does love or does like Kate, uh, Kayvon Thibodeau, who probably three months ago was the consensus number one pick in the draft. But there has been some question about his uh, effort uh, at all times in games. And we'll see if that has a big impact. But I gave uh, the Lions, who really need a solid long-term edge player, Trayvon Walker of Georgia, who's really climbing the charts. You know, when I talk to a couple of people uh, over the weekend around the league, they all they think that Trayvon Walker's going in the top five. So I gave him, and, and, and one of the reasons, Paul, as one team pointed out, he's 275 pounds, <clears throat> and he said we're all talking about him as an edge player but he can also be a three technique player he can play in the middle of the line at 275 and he's got maybe he's not John Randall in the middle of the line but he has the ability to move around and make people miss you know with the uh in the dance with the elephants uh you know around the line of scrimmage Scheme versatility is huge there on that on that front. If you can find somebody who can not only play the edge but move inside a little bit, that's draft gold. And I, I think for the Lions, I won't say the franchise is in the position A, but for what they need and what this draft is really good at, sitting at two, even if the Jaguars do go Hutchinson at one, they have a couple of picks there who are worthy of the number one pick in terms of their talent. So I, I think they're in a wonderful spot, and it just makes all the sense in the world uh, to, to get whatever defensive end they like best. You know, Paul, at number three, where we've got the uh, the Houston Texans, as somebody in the league told me, he said, take the best long-term player. And, and, and here's what he said that was so interesting. 
think of the general manager and the kind of player he would like. And that obviously is Nick Casario with his long history with Bill Belichick. And think of a player who you believe is going to get a second contract. So in other words, people say, well, who cares about that? Well, if you're going to pick a player third in the draft where Houston is, if you're going to pick a player third in the draft, you want to make sure that you're picking a cornerstone guy who's going to be around for the next eight years. Or you, you want to give yourself the best chance. When I put those two things together, I said, Evan Neal, Alabama. Fits the first one because he's a Nick Saban guy. And then the second one is he's an absolute solid rock as a player and a guy. And with Laramie Tunsil this year, the left tackle playing at age 29, I think you play Evan Neal wherever for this year. And at some point, probably in the near future, you're likely to have him take over at left tackle for Laramie Tunsil. I think about all the needs the Texans have personnel-wise and how high they think in this draft number three. And I just go right to what uh, former NFL GM Charlie Casserly used to tell me every draft season when I used to work with him each season that when you're in this spot, when you're not a very good team, you're picking high and you can really pick anywhere. You're in this position of picking out, okay, which player, no matter the position, do I think is most likely to make the most Pro Bowls? And that's the guy you take because you have so many needs. You're not looking to kind of plug and play one spot. You just want a wonderful player. And I think about where the Texans are, and that's the thought that comes to mind. Yeah, I think that's really, really smart. And so if you're the Texans, maybe you say, hey, listen, we will take the mystery that is Kayvon Thibodeau right here because they need a pass rusher. I mean, look. We've already mentioned Kayvon Thibodeau with every team we're talking about. Uh, and I have him dropping a little bit. But I think that's a really good point by Casserly. Number four, New York Jets. So um, as someone who knows the Jets well told me, right here, give them the best defensive player and hope it's a corner. So... I can't sit here and tell you right now that Sauce Gardner is the best defensive player in this draft. Uh, I, I because I don't, I really don't believe that. I think some of the Georgia guys uh, probably are better. Uh, and when I say best defensive player, the best defensive player available. Um, and the way I have the draft going, I have two edge guys already gone. So the reason I gave him Sauce Gardner. Uh, who's the cornerback from the University of Cincinnati. You know, here's a guy who in 800 pass rush snaps at uh, at the University of Cincinnati in his career allowed zero, uh, not pass rush, pass defense snaps, allowed zero touchdowns uh, in coverage. And he came out at the combine and he said, I'm not going to allow any in the NFL either. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But I just think Sauce Gardner at 6'2", 188 pounds, probably will end up playing in the NFL maybe between 195 and 200 consistently. And I think that is the kind of big corner that everyone in the NFL is looking now, looking for now so that these uh, you know, basically some power forward wide receivers are not going to win every 50-50 ball with you. So I, I gave him Sauce Gardner and I put a little bit of an asterisk saying that it won't shock me somehow, some way, if they end up with Derek Stingley here. And we're going to discuss Stingley a little bit later. But give me your thoughts on the Jets at four. I'm much more of a fan of Gardner than Stingley. And I, <clears throat> here's the big reason why, Peter. I've, I've seen him in person. I've watched him play in person. And while you get down on the field next to him, he's very long and lean and probably much more slender than you would like. But his energy level, his compete level, his instincts, his production level, no matter how you want to measure it, terrific. And you look at that division. Tyreek Hill is now there. Developing Mac Jones is there. Potential multiple MVP and Josh Allen is there. And if you want to take a corner like that, 
I, I'm not, a, I mean, I'm no more fan of the Jets than any other team, but I would quietly applaud that pick inside because I think he's a wonderful player in terms of competes and production at a very important spot on the field. Paul, let's go to number five, the New York Giants. <clears throat> My feeling about the Giants uh, is that I think their pick is going to be impacted by whether new general manager Joe Shane is able to trade either five or seven. The Giants have the fifth and seventh picks in the draft about whether Joe Shane is going to be able to trade one of those picks. If he does, and I think he will trade one of those picks, he definitely wants to. If he's able to trade one of those picks, that could impact what they're doing. And I think um, if they do trade one of those picks, absolutely, definitely, they'll pick a tackle. And and if they and if they keep both of those picks, then one of the two will be a tackle. So I think, and, and so if they're going to keep seven, uh, if they get into the draft and know they're going to keep seven, five might not be a tackle, but I ended up giving them Iki Ikwanu, the tackle from North Carolina State, um, who is very clean as a prospect, uh, is a really good effort and power player, very good on the run, very good in, uh, uh, in pass pro. And I think the Giants look at this and say, okay, listen, if we draft Iki Iquanu, however it works out, left or right side, between uh, Andrew Thomas and Iki Iquanu, probably Thomas stays on the left for now. Iquanu is on the right. But now you give Daniel Jones a fighting chance in his must-play-well year in 2022. Your last sentence there, Peter, kind of walks me right to what, what I was thinking this entire time that you're talking about the Giants and what they might do. Listen, they, they've been a bit of a mess here recently. You could pick a lot of players and say this makes sense for them. But I think top of their list of needs and thoughts right now, what is Daniel Jones? Is he going to be a good quarterback for this franchise? Is he going to be a mistake we made a few years ago early in the first round? Uh, and that's where, that's where it starts for Brian Dable. And any kind of pick, that helps him, like using their highest pick to not only help him be good this year, Peter, but to help the organization figure out what they have in him because he's truly an enigma that this one could go either way. So whatever the pick is, I would love to see it for Daniel Jones, for him and for the organization to kind of decipher what do we have in this guy. Right. I think that's a great point. Uh, let's go to pick number six, Carolina. I gave them Kenny Pickett, the quarterback from Pitt, um, they have consistently struck out trying to get a quarterback. I don't think Kenny Pickett deserves to be the sixth pick in the draft, but quarterbacks change all equations. Matt Rule has a history with Kenny Pickett. As a high school uh, junior, Pickett in South Jersey, Pickett committed to Temple with coach Matt Rule in 2016. And at the end of that season, uh, when Matt Rule went to Baylor at the time, at the end of 2016, um, Pickett decommitted, and then he ended up going to Pitt. And again, look, this is like, okay, the puzzle pieces fit well. They need a quarterback. There's a lot of guesswork in here. But I think that the owner will pressure, uh, you know, GM Scott Fitterer and a head coach Matt Rule to try everything possible to continue to attack the quarterback quandary. Now, the Panthers have one pick. I think the number is in the top 130, but certainly one in the top 100. And so this is a really, really important pick. I think obviously the Panthers, if there's any way they could trade down a little bit, they would want to because they need more ammo and they need more good young talent. But as of right now, <clears throat> having traded <clears throat> particularly their second round pick in the deal to get Sam Darnold with the Jets last year, I think this becomes a really interesting pick uh, at number six overall because I don't know that Carolina is going to make it, but if they do, 
I strongly suspect they could take a quarterback here. I want to start by backing up a couple months ago, Peter, when we were kind of connecting the dots, thinking about quarterbacks in the first round of this draft and quarterbacks high and knowing that this wasn't a highly respected class of first round potential quarterbacks. This is the situation that's uh, kind of worried me in the abstract. Okay. Quarterback gets pushed up team in the top 10 desperately wants a quarterback. There may or may not be one that good owner who aggressively wants this to happen coach on the hot seat. Not a wonderful veteran backup to really help this guy. And, and, and here we are. And that's nothing against Sam Darnold. But if you bring in a quarterback who needs to be helped, I think there are better options in terms of veterans to bring him along. I, I just, the pick makes sense. I just think this is, and it's going to happen. There's going to be a team that takes a quarterback too high. Uh, th this one kind of reeks of that to me. And I, I don't think it's a wonderful situation for any of these quarterbacks to go. Agree. Number seven, this is where the Giants are scheduled to have their second pick of the first round. And I had them trading this pick to the Los Angeles Chargers uh, down to number 17 and picking up the Chargers number one pick in 2023. With this pick, I had the Chargers taking Charles Cross, uh, the tackle um, who, who had a great career in the SEC. And I think when I look at this particular pick, this is the last tackle in this draft of the three that is a consensus day one player in the NFL. I think he'd be great for the Chargers to pair with Rashawn Slater long term. Um, and because, look, they've got a franchise quarterback and they need two long term tackles to protect the guy. I'm going, to, I'm going to put this one back on you a little bit, Peter, because I want to hear a little more. After all these years of being around analysts who are given the task of putting together a mock draft, I think it's extremely difficult to forecast a pick. It's even harder to pick a trade that you think might happen. So yes. is there, do you have any, any behind the scenes insight to why you went with this one, or is this just all an instinct on, not on what you think might happen? Not, not particularly, Paul, other than I know that the Giants want to trade down I know that the Chargers are very interested in adding a tackle um, in this draft. I thought there were two teams that would be excellent candidates to move up. I thought it would be the Chargers, and after that trade yesterday, I'm still thinking about it, the Chargers and the Saints. But I get the feeling after talking to Mickey Loomis that he would not trade a ransom to move up for a tackle. Remember, they uh, got Ryan Ramchick late um, in, in the draft in 2017, late in the first round in 2017. And I just think that, I, I just don't see the Saints trading all this draft capital for a tackle. For a quarterback, maybe, but for a tackle, no. So, no, I don't have any inside uh, stuff, Paul, but I just think that this is one of those cases where the puzzle pieces just fit. And again, I have no idea that I'm going to do this when I do my mock draft. I might, right. I might not, but it's, uh, you know, my, I've got to solidify my mock draft like 18 days from now. I have absolutely no clue what I'll do, but I wouldn't be surprised if I have the Giants trading this pick. I'll say that. Uh, let's go to number eight with the Atlanta Falcons. And look, this is an absolute total dart throw but I gave them Malik Willis. He's a kid from Atlanta. He is a, uh, a an electric thrower of the ball. He is one of those guys who you just want to be around. Uh, he's very, very magnetic personality. I could see Arthur Blank walking into a draft meeting <clears throat> at some point and saying, hey, guys, listen. We need a long-term quarterback. We may never be in this position to draft a guy like this again. But if they do do this, to me, if and look, I don't know if Arthur Smith likes Malik Willis. But if they were to do this, I'd just say one thing. The strength and the interesting thing about this is everybody says, you, know, you really want to get Malik Willis into your system, onto your team, and you want to work with him, and you really want to train him for a while. And if you can do that, 
you know, don't play him early, <clears throat> that's when you might really have something. And I just think about Arthur Smith, who is one of these, uh, you know, one of these professorial types, one of these guys who can get a quarterback and make him better if there's not a lot of pressure to play him early. And look, you've got uh, Marcus Mariota now uh, who signed a two-year contract and maybe he just plays one, but who knows? Maybe you keep him around for two. So that's sort of how I went to Malik Willis at number eight. I like this one a lot, Peter. I like it more than uh, than Pickett at six to Carolina. Going to give you a couple of reasons why. Uh, number one, I, I love the upside of Malik Willis more than Kenny Pickett. And I hate it when people just say upside and move on. So I'm going to give you a little more specific response to that. To me, with his upside, I think he's a really gifted downfield passer. Not just strong arm, not just aggressive by nature. I think he has a lot of layers to his talent in terms of pushing the ball downfield. I yep. like that a lot. I think he's a really good runner, an instinctual runner that you can work into the offense much the way you could Marcus Mariota, so that's a good fit. That gets me to Mariota. I, I like the idea of a rookie quarterback coming into play, uh, play behind him. I like him as a person. I like what he's done as a quarterback. I like his experience, and I think it's a really good spot to go in and grow behind somebody who has a similar game. They both move pretty well, and I think he could learn a lot. And then the culture, the environment, I think there's a little more patience, even though the NFL is not a, a patient place at all for quarterbacks, a little more of that with the head coach GM combo in Atlanta than there is in Carolina. So I, I think this would be a great spot for Malik Willis. Here's, here's the other part of that, and I don't want to belabor the point. Of all the players... I've talked to, met, hung around with a little bit in the last few years in the NFL. There's no nicer person yeah. and team first player more than Marcus Mariota. And that's one of the reasons why I think it'd be great to have Malik Willis there because yeah. Marcus Mariota understands life in the NFL if the other guy is better, he's going to play. And I'm not going to be a jerk and not help this guy. So I, I think if, if they like Malik Willis, they won't have to worry about slapping Marcus Mariota in the face. Let's go to pick number nine. So this was a tough choice for me because John Schneider, the Seattle GM, is not risk averse. You know, he's... He's okay with taking risks, particularly for gold mine players. And in my opinion, the guy in this draft who's the biggest mystery and the biggest gold mine potentially um, is Derek Stingley. So that people understand, Derek Stingley, when he was a true freshman, depending on which All America team you look for, he was voted first team All America. And the reason why that's so significant is that not only is he playing for one of the great programs in college football, having a great season, a very good season that year, uh, clearly, but he's doing it and every, not every day maybe, but many days in practice, he's going one-on-one -on -one with Jamar Chase and winning his share of the battles. So at that point, everybody is looking at Derek Stingley like, wow, what a player, incredible, blah, blah, blah. But his next two years, uh, you know, because of illness and an ankle injury and then a Liz Frank injury, um, basically Derek Stingley, uh, you know, disappeared off the NFL radar for most of the last two seasons. Now, you say, well, <clears throat> there's no way I'm picking a guy number nine who is that uh, questionable. So in my conversations over the weekend, I talked to one NFL coach who has been studying the corners because his team is very likely is going to take one. And he said, when I look at the 2019 tape of Derek Stingley, he has the best feet of any college cornerback I've ever seen. Now, 
that's a heck of a statement. And this is this is a younger coach, so I don't want to say that this guy's 65 years old and been doing it for 30 years. But this is a younger coach, but still, I said, man, that is a heck of a statement. The best feat you've ever seen on a college corner. So I think what happens is you look at Derek Stingley. If he's healthy now, he's over his Liz Frank injury. He says he is. And I can see him jumping up into the top 10 as a physical, tall, long corner who answers so many questions that you ask about your corner in this day and age in the NFL. Can he compete with the best big receivers in football? And I think Derek Stingley can. I think the answer is yes, he can. But the, 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 the part of that that also has to be considered, Peter, based off of what the LSU defense did, or I guess more importantly did not do of this last season, is how consistently will he do it? Because teams want to turn on the tape and see not only the traits and the, the, the flashes, as they say, they want to see it more times than not. And you just watched that entire LSU defense last year. It was troubling. Uh, the efforts and the compete level down, down all the time. And he was part of that. So did, did the group drag him down? Or was he, as one of the most talented players on that side, was he one of the ones, was he responsible for how they looked, which was really disappointing? I don't know. I don't you know, know the, the kid problem, at all. Paul, is, yeah, the problem, the problem there is that uh, he had academic difficulties this year. He mm -hmm. had the Liz Frank uh, injury this year. And look, I don't know if there was a time where he was healthy and, and you know, playing at his peak or, or you know, you know, gave up or what. I, I just don't know enough about it. But I do mm -hmm. think that is a question that a lot of people are going to ask about both of the last two years. You know, yeah. did he fight through things well enough? Right. I, I, I agree. And again, I don't, I don't, I've not sat down with the kid. I've, I've not talked to a lot of people who evaluated him, but I've watched enough to know. And I know the potential enough. I saw him play in high school, ridiculous talent. And as you mentioned, freshman year, good. And you know, he had to really compete in practice. So there's a lot of upside, but, there are also a lot of questions about every one of these prospects. Every time you're talking about taking them in the top 10, this comes up. And I think that the downside or the negative side of his evaluation, you know, what happened to that LSU defense the last couple of years? I know there were injuries with him, uh, but what are the parts of that, that that really concern us with our franchise moving forward? And I guarantee you that that's being considered everywhere. Paul, at number 10, I got the New York Jets with their second pick of the first round. And I have to tell you, everybody, including one person who knows Joe Douglas well, said with one of these two picks, you got to give him a receiver. And I wanted to give him a receiver. In fact, every receiver is left in my mock draft or my projection, I should call it, in the top 10 when I have the Jets picking at 10. But I didn't give him a receiver. I gave him Kayvon Thibodeau, the pass rusher from Oregon. Now, it could be that Joe Douglas, who is a little bit more risk-averse than a lot of his peers, uh, is going to say, look, I don't want to take a chance on Kayvon Thibodeau and some of the things that we've seen on the tape where he's not playing all out on every snap. Um, so I, 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 I'm not convinced this will happen. But I do think that Joe Douglas sits there and he said, listen, we have the 35th and 38th picks in uh, overall in this draft, like in the second round. You know, think about this, Paul. They have, in essence, the exact same position in round one and round two. They have the, basically, they have the fourth pick in round one. They have the 10th pick in round one. And in the second round, they have the fourth pick in the second round, and they have the seventh pick in the second round. So when you think about it, <coughs> I just say, Joe Douglas has got to be thinking. Let's say there's a receiver I love who maybe at pick number 20, he's still there. It'd be easy for me to go back into the first round 
and basically say, because let's say around 23 or 24, right around there, you're getting to the point where trading his two twos for that pick and getting pick a receiver, Jamison Williams, Drake London, I don't know, either of the Ohio State receivers who were left. But I think that they're much more inclined <clears throat> to, <clears throat> instead of taking a receiver at 10, to basically say, if we want to, we can trade back up in the first round and get one of the real quality receivers somewhere in the 20s. This pick at San Peter is the kind of pick that, that brings in so many of the uh, kind of pressure point talking points of this round one. You could really spend, you know, 10 or 20 minutes talking about just this pick. Number one, the fact that Kayvon Thibodeau may still be there at 10. I mean, that's, there's a lot right. of interest there, but I would love to see them go wide receiver. And every year, I mean, there are different faces to this, different positions and personalities to it, but there's a team that has a shot at the number one player at that position, whether it's at six or 12 or 18 at this point, number 10, that's a position of need. The Jets would love a wide receiver. At 10, every receiver is still going to be there. Now, is that person worth the 10th pick? Probably not. Would they fit better at 18 or 19? Yes. But here you are Here you are in this spot to use your highest pick on a position you really need. I would like for them to go wide receiver at 10, whichever one they like the most. It kind of goes against draft board value, but it would really boost up Zach Wilson, and it's a spot they have to have. So I, I think it would be great if they kind of went against it a little bit there and came up with the receiver they like best. It's very, it's a very interesting and very, um, very difficult to project. But hey, look, we're going to have a lot of time to talk about the draft uh, in the next three podcasts. But I think I'd, I, I want to move to some of the other things that uh, are happening around the NFL right now. And <clears throat> I'm going to start, Paul, with trying to explain why so many people around the NFL are upset or at least miffed with the Cleveland Browns for giving Deshaun Watson a $230 million contract, all guaranteed over a five-year period. And most people, I think, believe that, ah, you can always get around the cap, you can always evade the cap, uh, and who cares how much of the contract is guaranteed? If he's gonna be on your team anyway, it doesn't matter guarantee the money because you're always going to keep this guy. <clears throat> but I want to explain, I'm just going to read a, a short blurb from my column that will give you a good idea of what it means when a team guarantees a contract. Okay. Every year after the Super Bowl, the NFL totals the guaranteed money that each team has on its books. Sometime in March, the teams are told how much money they have to have in escrow to cover the cost of those contracts. In the case of Watson, when the league does its accounting next winter, it will tell the Browns they'll have to put $184 million, which is the sum total of the final four years of the contract owed to Watson, in escrow to cover the commitment to Watson. So... Cleveland gets a break in year one. They don't have to put the first $46 million in escrow because the contract was signed after the NFL makes its guaranteed uh, assignments for the year to every team. So then I ask, why does this matter? Because the next two quarterbacks likely to be in line for mega deals, Joe Burrow of Cincinnati and Justin Herbert of the Chargers, are employed by owners that have football as the family business. Mike Brown of the Bengals, Dean Spanos of the Chargers, don't have anywhere near the liquidity of teams with money from other businesses. Haslam, for instance, is a truck stop magnet. So the reason that you find that a bunch of teams aren't happy with this is, I doubt sincerely, that Mike Brown is going to do a contract with Joe Burrow that is totally guaranteed. I can't see him doing it. And the, the bad part of that for the Bengals, I think, is that 
let's just say they do shorter contracts with Burrow, which if I'm Burrow, I really don't mind because then I'm continually getting paid at the top of the market. But if you have to do that and you're the Bengals, <clears throat> that could end up being a real problem for you in financial long-term planning. So people ask, why are the other teams upset? That's why the other teams are upset. Really smart points to think about there, Peter. And uh, it just makes me think of the question. It's very early in this process, and I'm just thinking about it for the first time. But who do you think at this point has has the leverage to win that? Is it player and agent because a team just did it with this position, and that's now the way it's going to be, and you're going to have to do it as well? Or because it's it's been so the other way? The NFL doesn't do this. They haven't gone to the baseball yeah. type contract. Because it's only one, I, hey, Paul, because of the situation that you brought up, I mean, is it is it advantage organization here? Paul, the, the NFL teams are going to argue that that's a one-off. And they're going to say 14% of Patrick Mahomes' contract is guaranteed. 39% of Josh Allen's contract is guaranteed. This is way out of line with what has been done with a lot of the franchise quarterbacks. So the argument will go back and forth, but I think this is a great thing for quarterbacks and agents um, who want to, A, continually do contracts who are not looking and saying, I want a 10-year contract or whatever it is that Mahomes signed 12 years. I want one of those. I, I think the contracts <clears throat> almost necessarily now are going to be shorter. Paul, let's go to, I want to, Speaking of inside baseball or inside football, whatever we would call it, I wanted to explain, I had a few questions over the last few days about the Bruce Arian story. Uh, we'll go back a few days now. On Wednesday night at 8.15 p.m., uh, I broke the story along with Sam Farmer of the Los Angeles Times that Bruce Arians was going to quit coaching, move into a front office role, and uh, be replaced by Todd Bowles <clears throat> as uh, as the coach. And look, I don't break a lot of stories anymore at all. It's really not what I do. I'm not 24-7 plugged in uh, the way I was, say, 15 years ago. Um, these stories are usually the province of, you know, Adam Schefter or or uh, Ian Rappaport, or, or Jay Glazer, Tom Pelissero. Those are the guys who were breaking most of the stories. But what happened in this particular case is that recently Bruce Arians contacted Sam Farmer and I. Um, we have been, I've been writing about Arians for a long time, uh, going back before uh, he was the coach of the Arizona Cardinals. And uh, so... And, and Sam has been writing about him for a long time. So Bruce Arians basically thought that I have this story and instead of just uh, giving it, uh, issuing a, a press release and, and doing it that way, I'm going to give this story to two guys who I've had a good relationship with over the years. So he called us, he proposed this thing. He said, listen, keep this under your hat for a few days, but... Uh, when the time comes, I'm going to give you the story. And so a couple days before, three days before he released it, he talked to Sam and to me, giving us the reasons why he did this. And then um, he said, you know, Wednesday at 8.15, go with it. So we went with it and kind of shock of shock, Paul, shock of shocks, Paul, uh, <laughs> the story stayed a secret. And the reason that Arians knew that he would is that, you know, he basically told us, look, I'm not beholden to anybody in the information business. I don't, I don't give out tidbits, nuggets, whatever. So I don't really care. And so that's kind of the way the story broke. And the one thing that I think uh, is interesting, and look, I have the same suspicions as everybody else. Yeah, did Tom Brady have anything to do with this? <clears throat> and the fact is, I don't know. Arian says no. The Bucks say no. Um, but there has been some tension between Brady and Arians. And so I, I don't know. I can't tell you 
what the truth is. But the one thing about this that I felt really got underplayed in the time after uh, this all happened, one thing that really got underplayed is that Arians at a time in the NFL when diversity and hiring minority coaches, black coaches, uh, is under attack from all places, uh, saying that, you know, the NFL just isn't doing a good enough job in promoting black coaches and minority coaches. Um, I think we, we have to remember that Bruce Arians on his last staff at Tampa had 11 black coaches on his staff. He also had two women. And the Bucks right now are left with a black head coach in Todd Bowles, a black offensive coordinator, a black uh, two black defensive co-defensive coordinators and a black special teams coordinator. So my feeling about all this is the whole world is uh coming down on Arians, the Bucks and Brady for for hiding how Brady orchestrated this all. He was the puppet master uh and I just have no evidence that that's true. Again, I'm not saying that it isn't true. But I do think at this time that we ought to give Arians a little bit of credit for what we do know. And that right now in the NFL, he's the biggest champion of black and minority coaches in football. Well said, Peter. And I'll tell you what, one other part of his game that we also know, and I was really kind of forced to, to go back and look at this and thinking about it again, when he moved from the head coach to upstairs with the Bucks, he became a head coach in college at the age of 30. OK, mid to late 30s, it didn't work out anymore at Temple. He moved on. He wasn't a head coach again in the NFL until he was 60, I believe. And the way he had That's to go correct. back to the grind and work his way up, really the, the coaching passing tree in the NFL. I mean, he, he spent time with every position, position coach for running backs, move on to New Orleans, position coach for tight ends. Then he started to become a little more known quarterback coach, wide receiver coach, offensive coordinator. Uh, but, but, but his arc uh, from head coach in college as a young man to finally head coach in college and a successful, I'm sorry, head coach in the NFL, there were a lot of years and decades in between where he had to go back and really learn and work the craft at every spot. Um, so Super Bowl yeah. champion, uh, champion of diversity, hey, that's enough of a legacy right there. You can stop there. But if you really want to kind of get into the weeds a little bit, the way he had to work and go back to work uh, to become a head coach again in the NFL is really impressive. Paul, let's, I, I, I wanted to add one last thing. I had a stat in my column this week. The last of Chuck Knoll's 209 NFL coaching victories came in 1991 when he was 59 years and 351 days old. So his last win in the NFL, one of the greatest coaches of all time, uh, he won at age 59. Bruce Arians' first of 95 NFL coaching wins. By the way, all 95 in his 60s. The first of his 95 NFL coaching victories came when he was 60 years old. And so yeah. it just goes to show you that, first of all, there's no one way to do this. There's no one way for anybody to say, well, this is the plan we have with head coaches. This is the plan we have with a quarterback. You have to be malleable. You have to be adjustable. Two teams gave Bruce Arians a shot when he was in his 60s. The Arizona Cardinals, he led them to uh, uh, an NFC championship game, which they lost against Carolina. And then uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who obviously he led them to 29 wins plus a Super Bowl in his last two years as coach in Tampa. So anyway, lots of ways to do this, but I think both Arizona and Tampa are happy that they gave this old timer a chance when he was in his 60s. Paul, the last thing we'll get into. I'm really curious about your thoughts of playoff overtime. We've had a lot of discussions about playoff overtime. And we have basically gone over it, and we talked about it a bunch last year. 
Sean Payton contacted me over the weekend and he said, hey, wait a minute. Because I said, hey, now you probably want to take the ball second. And he goes, and he, he said, let me ask you, is it an option at the start of overtime to defend a goal? And I checked on it. Yes, it was. It was an option to, uh, to uh, uh, basically to defend one goal. And he goes, well, if there was any weather at all, even a light breeze, I would choose to defend the goal. And I said, why? And he goes, you're getting the ball anyway. You know you're going to get a possession in overtime. Why not if there's an eight mile an hour breeze in the stadium? Why not take the advantage of the breeze whether you're going to get the ball sec first or second? It's going to be an advantage because what nobody knows watching the game on TV is that it's always an advantage when you take that. And I thought, now that is really interesting. Instead of automatically just deferring and and basically uh, knowing you're going to take the ball second, I kind of like the take the breeze angle. But I don't know. What did you think when you heard that? First of all, Sean, Pen uh, Sean Payton and Breeze mentioning it just seems to all go together very well, those two, <laughs> those two names or terms. But, yeah. I mean, Peter, this is intriguing and interesting because we, we get back to the moral of the story, why people like you and so many people around the NFL just thought it was so necessary to change the overtime rule in, in the playoffs. It's one sentence. Both teams guaranteed a possession. So now that you know that, you, you can walk through this door of all these fun conversations and all these different possibilities. And what if this, what if you value this? Hey, think about this. It's all possible because both teams are now guaranteed a possession. So I hadn't thought about the, you know, let the weather dictate what you're going to do. It's a great follow-up by you to find out if that was in fact an option at the coin toss. Uh, but I mean, it's just, uh, it's changed the game a hundred percent. Uh, for the reality of January and February football and for what we can talk about now because both teams know they're going to get the ball. Paul, this was a uh, a very, I'd call it a well-rounded podcast. We did a lot in this podcast. And I, you've exercised my 64-year-old brain a lot this week. And for that, I'm grateful. <laughs> Thanks so much for all of the back and forth this week. It really was a lot of fun. And for everyone who listened to the podcast this week, who experienced the podcast on YouTube, found us wherever you find your podcast, thanks so much. We're going to be back next week with another podcast that will hopefully get you a little bit more prepared in real time for the uh 2022 NFL Draft. Thanks a lot for listening, and we will see you next week. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.